this week's episode of Becoming Elizabeth, Lighten Our Darkness, had us thinking that Elizabeth might just be pregnant, saw the end of Queen Catherine Parr, and should, I feel, have been called Becoming Mary. Let me share with you the history behind this week's episode and my views on how things played out. Hi, I'm Claire Ridgway. I'm an author of Tudor history books. This week I was actually able to relax a bit more with Becoming Elizabeth um, and really enjoy it as a fictional retelling of historical events because Seymour and Elizabeth were separated. I just want to point out that in these videos I'm not criticising the series for inaccuracies. As I've said, it's not a documentary and so doesn't owe any kind of duty to historical accuracy. I'm simply sharing the history behind the events and the people shown, and also sharing my views on how I think this series is playing out. This week's episode opened with Elizabeth in the household of Sir Anthony Denny and his wife at Cheshunt. It is true that Catherine Parr sent Elizabeth there in June 1548, after she'd caught Seymour and Elizabeth in an embrace. And it is true that Denny's wife, Joan, was Catherine Ashley's sister, and that Sir Anthony Denny had been close to Henry VIII and had attended on him in his dying days. We see Elizabeth being grumpy and stressed, worried about her period being late, but in reality that summer she was actually rather ill and had a royal physician attending on her. Her symptoms did include irregular menstrual cycles, but also digestive disorders, jaundice and migraines. It's likely that these were caused by the stress of her situation. I don't believe that Elizabeth did go all the way with Thomas Seymour. Catherine Ashley in her later deposition did not state that, so I don't think Elizabeth had that worry, but the situation was stressful enough. Her time at Cheshunt away from Catherine did indeed set tongues wagging too. I can't tell you how glad I am though that they didn't make Elizabeth pregnant in the show. Phew! Contrary to what was shown in this episode, Elizabeth's letters to Catherine that summer were answered and Catherine wrote of how much she missed Elizabeth and wanted to see her again. And Catherine also corresponded with Mary and managed to heal the rift caused by her quick marriage to Thomas Seymour. Moving on to Edward VI and religious reform. At his coronation in February 1548, Archbishop Cramner spoke of the boy being a second Josiah. I find it interesting that the man responsible for the Book of Common Prayer is absent from the series. It's rather odd that Thomas Cramner is not featured. He was such a hugely influential figure in Edward's reign, working closely with the King and the Lord Protector and then John Dudley. I'm not sure why he's been missed out. Edward's biographer Chris Skidmore writes of how the image of the boy king as a second Josiah was cited frequently during his reign, and that it was an expression both of Edward's own supremacy and the mission that lay before him. It's also true that religious reform began in earnest, with the use of rosary beads being condemned, images removed and destroyed, visitations of churches ordered, and traditional processions were banned. Then, in 1549, the Book of Common Prayer was published, which caused tensions, and in particular, the Prayer Book Rebellion in the Southwest, which I'm sure we'll see soon in the series. Catherine Parr and Thomas Seymour were, however, not involved in encouraging the young king in his religious reform, and they are being given far too much credit in the series. I thought that Catherine's pregnancy was rather glossed over in the show and went so very quickly. In reality, Catherine and Thomas moved to Thomas's property, Sudley Castle, in the Cotswolds for Catherine's final months. There, on the 30th of August 1548, Catherine gave birth to a little girl, Mary, who she chose to name after her beloved stepdaughter, the Lady Mary, who was to be the baby's godmother. Catherine and Seymour were ecstatic at her safe arrival but on the 3rd of September, Catherine came down with a fever. 
Thomas Seymour and Catherine's dear friend Elizabeth Tyrrett attended on her. And Catherine, as historian Elizabeth Norton points out, in her delirium, seemed troubled by Seymour's presence, saying, I am not well handled, for those that be about me careth not for me, but standeth laughing at my grief. And the more good I will to them, the less good they will to me. When Seymour tried to assure her that he would do her no hurt, she answered, No, my lord, I think so. And then, But my lord, you have given me many shrewd taunts. She also complained that he'd prevented her from speaking to a doctor. Sadly, on the 5th of September 1548, Catherine died. While Seymour was grief-stricken by Catherine's death, it is true that he sought to marry Elizabeth, which is where the episode left us, Seymour whispering a proposal into her ear. I have been disappointed by Catherine Parr in this series. She's been rather shrewish and has sought to manipulate those around her. We certainly haven't seen the intelligent scholar of history who truly loved her stepchildren. It's such a shame. By the way, Elizabeth left Cheshunt in late 1548 not to move to Chelsea, but to set up her own household at Hatfield. Moving on to other storylines, following the death of Catherine Parr, Thomas Seymour was going to send Lady Jane Grey back to her parents, but then changed his mind. However, Francis and Henry Grey recalled Jane, and she went home temporarily until Seymour was able to persuade the Greys that he could arrange her marriage to the king. And what about Mary and Elizabeth? Did Mary visit Elizabeth at Cheshunt? Well, sadly not. Linda Porter writes that although they exchanged letters, they were seldom at court and there is no record of them entertaining each other at their houses. They saw little of each other during their half-brother's reign. Saying that though, I did enjoy the scene between the half-sisters. In fact, I enjoy any scene with Mary in it. I just love her character. Too often we see Mary the First as a very two-dimensional character, as Bloody Mary. But we see here a woman with a strong personality and an even stronger faith. Mary persuades Elizabeth to go back to court, to stop hiding. But when Elizabeth does go, she apologises and submits to her brother. She chooses the king. Whereas we see Mary celebrating a mass for her stepmother Catherine Parr in defiance of the king's rulings and choosing God over the king. I thought that was incredibly powerful. Elizabeth is a pragmatist, Mary is willing to be a martyr, I feel. I did enjoy, too, the scenes between Sir Anthony Denny and Elizabeth when he told her she'd inherited Chelsea, which she actually didn't, and that she would have advisers, but that she was capable of making her own decisions. He then makes her think about what she truly wants and tells her that she can control what others say about her. He helps her to realise her power her status, her newfound independence. By the way, I had to watch the cockfighting scene with Mary and Edward with my hands over my face, as I really don't like seeing things like that. But it was entertainment Tudor style, and we do know that Mary enjoyed things like that. So I can see her getting a kick out of it, and it being something that the siblings would have had in common. But her conversation with Catherine Parr was purely fictitious. After her initial shock and anger at Catherine's rather quick and unseemly marriage to Thomas Seymour, the two women were able to build bridges and correspond. There's no evidence that Mary approached Catherine about what happened to Elizabeth, although don't you wish she had? In this episode, we saw Edward, as in King Edward, tearing strips of the Lord Protector due to him receiving an invitation to the wedding of Mary, Queen of Scots and the Dauphin of France. In reality, Mary didn't marry Francis the Dauphin until 1558, so 10 years later. She did, however, become betrothed to him in July 1548 and left Scotland the following month to be brought up at the French court to prepare for her marriage to the Dauphin, thus ending any hope of Edward marrying her. We don't have any evidence of Edward's feelings on the matter, but he can't have been pleased. The War of the Rough Wooing, as it was called, was all for nothing. Scotland had gone back on the treaties made during Henry VIII's reign, and England had failed in enforcing the treaties. 
the Lord Protector too must have been angry. The scene between Henry Gray and Robert Dudley is also fictitious. It is true, however, that Robert could have lost a hand if Henry Gray had complained about the attack. In 1541, Sir Edmund Nivett was sentenced to lose a hand after punching another man at court. Fortunately, Nivett was pardoned. Henry Gray is such an unlikable character though, isn't he? And the Henry Gray that I've come to know from the historical sources is not very likable either. Ambitious, greedy, weak, and a bit of a chancer. I can fully understand Thomas Seymour in the series wondering how on earth he managed to produce the intelligent Lady Jane Grey. I think Bella Ramsey is doing a wonderful job of playing the 11-year-old Lady Jane Grey. Her piety comes across as annoying, and I think the real Jane could have been like that. When she was in the Tower in 1553 after her failed reign, she argued with the chaplain sent to convert her, used strong language about those who turned their back on Protestantism, and spoke out against Mary I and her religious policies. I think the 11-year-old Jane could have been quite annoying. Moving on. While Pedro de Negro really did exist and was a soldier who served under the Lord Protector, there is no evidence that one, he acted as a spy for Lord Protector Somerset, or two, that he built a relationship with Mary. I do love how they're using his character though, as a foil to show us Somerset's concerns about Mary and Mary's genuine faith, her lack of agenda, her honesty and strength of character, and her decision to put God first above everything else. Pedro can't help but be affected by this woman, the only player in the game who's following the rules, and he encourages her to be God's advocate to try and stop what is happening to the church and the country. I think the show at this stage could easily be called Becoming Mary, and I must say that I'm enjoying her scenes at the moment far more than Elizabeth's scenes. When Bishop Gardner warns her that her celebrating a mass for Catherine will stoke the fires at court, Mary says, let them burn. And we know that the real Mary was that defiant. She chose to disobey her brother's laws. She chose to publicly defy them. She was a tough cookie. And by the way, I don't think Mary did have a mass like that for Catherine, but it was a way of the series showing just what she was willing to do and contrasting her with Elizabeth who grovels in front of Edward and chooses her duty to him, saying, I am yours and yours alone. While Edward accepts Elizabeth's apology as she's on her knees and forgives her, Mary is on her knees praying to her God. It was a powerful scene flitting between them, and I admired Mary far more. Then, of course, the episode ended with Elizabeth's return being celebrated and Elizabeth reassuring Robert Dudley that the old her was a fool and that that girl was dead. Only for Thomas Seymour then to lean into her and propose marriage. How will Elizabeth handle this? Will the new Elizabeth be able to cope with Thomas? Or will she be taken back to the old her? We shall see. After my initial worry that they'd make Elizabeth pregnant, I thoroughly enjoyed the episode. The F word is overused and is jarring in my opinion, really distracting and is getting a bit silly. But the acting is excellent. The costumes are so much better than in a lot of historical dramas. The locations and sets are brilliant. If a bit lacking in colour, the Tudors liked a lot of colour, very gaudy. And I can enjoy this as a fictitious retelling and embellishment of history. But I'm Team Mary and Team Pedro, though. They're by far my favourite characters, and I can't wait to see more of them. Do remember that every Friday I'm holding Zoom discussions about each episode so that we can really talk Tudor, dissect them, and talk about the real history behind them. It's part of my online Elizabeth I event, Elizabeth I, The Life of Gloriana the Virgin Queen and I'm going to give you a link in the description so that you can register for that. It's really exciting, we're having such a good time. Anyway, I will see you soon, take care, bye bye.